The word of the Lord says, And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Now, we remember just last week, we were looking at the fact that Jesus Christ, this beloved son, he is the image of the invisible God. He is the firstborn over all creation, firstborn meaning sovereign one, supreme one, the highest of the high. He made all things, both in heaven and on earth, physical things and invisible things. He is the reason for all things. All things were made by him and for him. And not only that, but he holds all things together. He's the one who sustains all things. And then we look in verse 18 and we see the word and. I mean, it's amazing because the word and is a word of addition, right? I mean, just when we think we cannot talk any higher of the sun, just when it looks like we've gone as high as we possibly can, Jesus has been given enough props and enough praise. The Spirit of God, who is all about glorifying the Son of God, brings in this word and. And and, as we know, is a simple word, but it's a powerful word. I mean, that word can mean good news or bad news. I mean, children, if you heard you're going to get a spanking and you're going to bed early and, I mean, you'd be like, oh no, <laughs> right? What's coming next? Or if you were to tell your, your wife, we're going to go out to eat and we're going to go take a walk. And I mean, that is building anticipation. It has you on the edge of your, your seat. The Bible continues. And not only is he the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, the one who's made all things, not only is all that true, but he continues. And he is the head of the body, the church. Jesus Christ is the head of the body. And we, we look at some of the other titles of Jesus, and it's painting the same reality. He is the shepherd of the sheep. He is the chief cornerstone of the building. He is the bridegroom of the bride. He is the vine of the branches. He is the Lord of us all. He is the head of the body. This is communicating his ultimate Lordship, his ultimate authority, his ultimate control, his leadership, his ownership, his protection, his provision. Jesus Christ is in charge of everything. That's what head means. And we use head in our own language, right? Someone talks about being the head of the class, meaning that they're the best student or they are the, the leader in a particular field or industry. We call govern, uh, government leaders, they are the head of state. It's pointing to the idea that head means boss. Not only is Jesus Christ head of creation, not only is he in charge of the world and all that's in it, but he is also head of the body church. So what are some of the implications of Jesus Christ being the head of the body? Before we talk about body, I want to talk about him being the head. Three points to this. Christ is the head, not Paul, not popes, not your pastor. First, Christ is the head, not Paul. So this letter, think about it, right? It's being written by Paul. And Paul, I mean, arguably is, beside the Lord Jesus Christ, is the most significant, the most dynamic personality in the New Testament. I mean, th th this is a man who would be the Superman of the early church. I mean, a true superhero. He has a great origin story, right? He, he starts out as an enemy of the church and then becomes the beloved apostle. He's the one who fights to bring in the Gentiles, which was God's plan all along. So, you know, he's sticking up for the, the little guy. Think about his life. He risks death 
torture. He gets stoned and gets back up. He gets bitten by poisonous snake and doesn't die. He faces Greeks, Jews, crowds, kings. He faces prison. He even faces Nero himself. I mean, if kids had action figures in the early church, they would probably have an action figure of the Apostle Paul. Surely, Paul would have been seen as the head of the church by many people. Doesn't 1 Corinthians say, Paul quoting, some say, I am of Paul. But what else is true about Paul? As I said, he's writing this, and he's writing it from a prison. Not just any prison, a Roman prison. And what was he awaiting? He was awaiting trial to stand before the one man no Christian wanted to see, the sociopathic emperor Nero. And this is a man who kicked his pregnant wife in the stomach so many times that she died, as did the child. Why did he do this? Because she asked him why he came home so late. This is a man who killed his own mother. This is a man who took a young boy and forced him to be his wife. This was an evil man. This has even not even mentioned what he did to the Christian. Paul is awaiting a trial with this man. What happens if Paul dies? Every other Christian who stands before Nero doesn't make it out of there. What happens if Paul dies? I mean, he's already old. He's facing judgment. What's going to happen to the church? If he's killed, will the church end? Will the meeting stop? No. Why? Because, brothers and sisters, as you already know, Christ is the head of the church, not Paul. Many movements lose power, they lose steam, they lose followers once the main spokesman dies, but not the church. Think of the comforting counsel that even though Paul is in prison, James has been beheaded, Peter is probably next to die. The apostles are scattered all over the place and news of their gruesome death are coming in one after another. Hundreds of pastors are dying, horrible death. False teachers are surrounding the flocks and they're poisoning the minds. The the government, the Roman government is against the church. The Jewish government is against the church. The Greeks and the barbarians are all against the church. Can you hear the Colossians asking What will happen to our little church if Paul dies? And can you sense the concern they would have felt? Remember, Nero burned Rome and blamed it on the Christians. Can you hear them? We're being blamed for this great fire in Rome. Everyone hates us. No one wants to be around us. No one wants to even hear the gospel from us. And now our leader is in prison awaiting a torturous death. What does Paul tell us? Jesus is the head of the body the church. Leaders come and go, but the image of the invisible God remains forever. This has been the case throughout history. I mean, we know in the book of Acts, the Jewish authorities, they began ravaging the church with Saul as their chief persecutor, prosecutor. (laughs) They, They thought that this would end this little cult that they called the way. But what did that do? My my dear wife reminds me, don't mow over the weeds. It only makes things worse. Running the lawnmower over those few weeds might cut them down, but ultimately, what does it do? It just spreads the seeds all over the whole lawn. Likewise, the persecution in Jerusalem had unexpected results by the wicked. This is Acts 8, 4. Now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. So they're scattered because of persecution. And what do they do? They take the word with them everywhere they go. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. And the crowds with one accord paid attention to what was being said by Philip. When they heard him and saw the signs that he did for unclean spirits crying out with a loud voice came out of many who had them, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was much joy in that city. 
The wicked have often thought to kill the leaders, capture the pastors, torture the preachers, silence the writers, burn the books, kill the missionaries, because they think this will end this movement. But the church is the body of the head, which is Christ. Another example from history, you've heard of Bloody Mary, a true monster of her time, the queen who reigned over uh, England at the time, and she was making sure that the Catholic Church reigned supreme. And at the very beginning of her reign, there was a influential preacher named Hugh Latimer and another pastor in London named Nicholas, Nicholas Ridley. And they were captured because they would not say that the body and bread of communion was literally to be worshipped, the body and blood of Christ. And so they arrested them and they tied them to the stake. And here's what history says. After a 15-minute sermon urging them to repent, they were chained to the stake. As the fire took hold, Latimer was stifled by the smoke and died without pain. But poor Ridley was not so lucky. The wood was piled up above his head, but he writhed in agony and repeatedly cried out, Lord, have mercy upon me, and I cannot burn. Cranmer, who was made to watch, would go to his own death the following year. A horrible, horrible display of pain and suffering this torturous death. Before Ridley died, he recorded, he's recorded as saying this to his fellow brother in the flames. Be of good comfort, Master Ridley, and play the man. We shall this day light such a candle by God's grace in England as I trust shall never be put out. So here they are right at the beginning. They die horrible deaths. In three years, this bloody woman burned over 300 Christians. Men, women, even children younger than your very youngest. Why? Why so many? Why didn't this first death, this first martyrdom, this first torturous burning stop the movement? Because Christ is the head of the church. Not Ridley, not Latimer, not Peter, not James, not Paul. Secondly, Christ is the head, not the Pope. Now, I spoke with you uh, last week about the Council of Nicaea, and we got some really good things out of that council, right? We got the Nicaean Creed. We, we, we were introduced to this giant in the faith, Athanasius. He's just a deacon who was accompanying his pastor at the council, and he ends up being the chief spokesman in defending the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, equality with the Father so dynamically. But we got some bad things from Nicaea as well. The council was held in the palace of the emperor, travel was paid for by the Roman emperor, and when Arius was condemned as a heretic and banished, that was enforced and supported by the Roman Empire. Before this, Christians were hunted like deer. Uh, they, the, 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 to be a Christian was literally illegal. It was an illegal religion. This is a major change when you have emperor-supported, government-enforced help. You fast forward about 100 years and we have another great debate, um, possibly only second to Nicaea, and that would be the debate between Augustine and Pelagius, where they're debating whether, you know, the reality of the, the nature of man. Is man truly sinner? from Adam? Has that been passed down? Very, very important. Well, what was the result? Well, Augustine won. Pelagius was condemned as a heretic and he was exiled. The Council of Carthage condemned the teachings of Pelagius. The heretic was exiled to Constantinople in 429. Here's a major question though. Who enforced the banishment of Pelagius? The government. The government did. What we are seeing in these actions, unknown to Augustine or to Athanasius and them, is the pregnancy of the papacy. It is the beginning of what is called sacralism. Sacralism is the idea that the ruler of each individual area would decide the religion 
of those under his control based upon his own faith. In other words, if I'm the king and I'm a Baptist, then everyone in my kingdom is now Baptist. And if I change my religion, then everyone under my authority joins the religion that I have. This is obviously dangerous. When the pastors of the different churches vote on something and the king becomes the enforcer of those choices, major problems arise. Imagine the church, our church, GCA, uh, putting someone out of the church, putting them under the discipline of the church, and the police come and take that person away in handcuffs. That's what we're talking about. Now, how bad did this get? King Henry IV, who was the emperor of Rome at the time, he had offended the Pope. And because of that, the Pope excommunicated him, meaning he was cast out of the church. He couldn't take communion. He couldn't make confession. He was basically condemned, anathema. He was going to hell. The only way for him to be able to come back into the church is to have the forgiveness of the Pope. So what happened? This is literally a historical event. Henry, the emperor of Rome, reached Matilda's castle. This is freezing January in Italy. The Pope ordered that he be refused entry, waiting at the gates. Henry took on the behavior of penance. He wore a hair shirt, which was the traditional clothing of monks, walking barefoot. Many of his entourage, including the Queen Bertha of Savoy, the Prince Conrad, also removed their shoes. According to first-hand accounts of the scene, the king waited by the gate for three full days, barefoot in little clothing, waiting for this pope to open the gate to him. Throughout this time, he wore only his penitent hair shirt and fasted. Finally, on the 28th of January, the castle gates were open for Henry and he was allowed to enter. He knelt before Pope Gregory and begged his forgiveness. Gregory absolved Henry and invited him back into the church. How is this possible? Because they saw the Pope as the head of the church. And if anyone wanted to come into the church, the Pope had to give permission. If anyone was going to be removed, the Pope had the power to do it. So at this time, the church was the greatest power on earth because the Pope controls the king and the king controls the armies. This is not biblical. This is anti-biblical. The head of the church is Christ, not popes. Christ is the only one who brings people into the flock and the only one who can keep people out. But does he, does Jesus have people waiting outside of gates, freezing, waiting for him to open the door to them? What does he say? Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls." For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. On the contrary to this wicked Pope idea, Jesus says, whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. That's the head of the body. The false head made this king freeze for three days waiting for his forgiveness. The true head of the church is altogether different. Luke 18 says, now they were bringing even infants to him that he might touched them. And when the disciples saw it, they rebuked them. But Jesus called them to him saying, let the children come to me and do not hinder them. For to such belongs the kingdom of God. That is the true head of the church. We rejoice that there is a separation between church and the state because we don't want to control what the government does and we don't want the government controlling what we do as a church. Christ is the head of the body, not Paul not popes. And lastly, regarding the head, Christ is the head, not your pastor. And I'll tell you, it is a great privilege to shepherd the flock, but it must always be remembered that you are the flock of God and not mine. And during this time of sickness, it has been a great struggle. I've been tempted with um, all kinds of disparaging thoughts because I've been unable to care for my wife. I've been unable to care for my my little babies. I've been unable to care for the flock. And I was comforted 
with this truth. Actually, Mark Summers, some of you know him, pastor and corpus, he sent me a WhatsApp message and he said, the Lord is using this time when you can't minister to the church in the way you'd like to. He's even using this for their good. Oh, how kind the Lord is to us weaklings. He really is the shepherd of his flock and he cares for us. Amen. Brothers and sisters, may I remind you of something that you already know. The Lord is is your shepherd. He is the one who supplies your need. He is the one who feeds you. He is the one who sustains you. He is the one who comforts you. He is the one who counsels you. He is the one who keeps you. It's a great blessing to know the reality of this. The chief shepherd is the head of the body, not Paul, not popes, not your pastor. That's the head. But what about this this body talk? He is the head of the body, the church. So what is the body? We're told immediately the church. What can we learn from this language of the body? Well, what we see, the body communicates unity in diversity. Um, Romans 12, 4 through 5. For as in one body, we have many members. And the members do not all have the same function. My wife was saying this earlier about in in Nehemiah. Here are these different parts, these different people doing different things. So we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. One body, unity, many members, diversity. Well, what is our unity? Our unity is in Christ. Our unity is eternal life by faith in Christ. Our unity is the glory of God as our goal. Our unity is in the Holy Spirit who unites us. And we're all after the same thing. We want Christ to be on display. We want God to be glorified. We want the Spirit to be leading. We want the sinner to be saved. We want the church to be strengthened. We want the word to be believed, the gospel to be proclaimed, sin to be hated, God to be loved. We want the same thing. That is the beauty of the unity and the diversity. Every Christian wants the same thing, no matter the denomination, no matter the time in history. But we're not all the same. We have unity and purpose and goal, but many members. That communicates diversity. One body, many members. Some are preachers, some are missionaries, some are blue collar, some are white collar, some are no collar, some are housewives, some are administrators, some are deacons, some are prayer warriors, some are encouragers. We all are given gifts to do the same thing. Listen now, even though our gifts don't do the same things. We're all given gifts to do the same thing, to glorify God, to upbuild the church, but all of our gifts don't do the same thing. Some have speaking gifts, some have gifts of mercy and ministry and faith and generosity and all administrative and organization. Think think of the symphony, that the symphony, there they are. When I was at the, the Shepherds Conference, I got to see this, this beautiful uh, symphony um, of, uh, of the master's uh, university there. And what did they have? They had pianos and they had tubas and they had cymbals and they had drums and they had saxophones and they had violins and they had triangles and harps and all of these instruments. They all look different. They are played different. They all make individual sounds. And none of them by themselves could make the beautiful music that they made when they were together. Brothers and sisters, that's us. There is one body, but many members. We have one goal, one sound, one musical piece that is being played, the glory of God, the beautiful gospel, but each of us individually play our own part in it. And it looks different, but together it's wonderful. It's glorious. And who is leading them all? Who is at the head of this beautiful symphony called the body? The conductor. Christ is the head. He wrote the music. He is leading the notes. He is telling this uh, side when to be silent, this side when to, to play louder, softer. He is the one controlling the symphony that is the church. So whatever you do, 
Do it for the glory of God. If you preach, preach for the glory of God. If you sing, sing for the glory of God. When you make a meal, do it to the glory of God. If you build computers, do it to the glory of God. When you perform a scene, when you plant a garden, when you clean a house, when you solve math problems, when you pour a cup of water, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. We see unity and diversity by the imagery of a body, but we also see that the body reminds us that the church is an organism and not an organization. The imagery of a body reminds us that the church is not a business. Now, we must be, like Jesus said, about our Father's business, but we are not a business. We do not operate as a business. We do not seek the counsel of business insiders. We do not seek out the 12 steps to make our church grow following some foolish, carnal, worldly business model. No, that's not how a body grows. Bodies do not grow the way businesses grow. Businesses and bodies are completely different. Our brother Raymond was talking about recovering from his illness. And what was he doing? He said, well, I'm just getting rest and I'm just eating the right things. And, you know, there are certain ways in which bodies grow. Bodies grow by being fed healthy food. That would be the word of God. Sound doctrine. That's how the church grows. Truth. Bodies grow by exercise. That would be the disciplines of the Christian faith. Working out our salvation by faith. Word, prayer, uh, breaking of bread, the fellowship, all of the disciplines of the Christian faith. Bodies grow by avoiding poison and hazardous things and substances, right? We don't want to put poison into our bodies. That's going to break down the body. What would that be? That would be the sin, the temptation of this world. Corrupt communication, corrupt company, staying away from those things that are poisonous to our spiritual health. That's how bodies grow. Now, may I say this, just because we are an organism and not an organization doesn't mean that we are not supposed to be organized. Again, the beautiful picture of a body shows all of the parts of the body working together. The human body is a tremendous example of different parts working together because every part is doing its part. And you know what? First Corinthians talks about that, that there's the ear and the eye and they can't say to one another, I don't need you. And the hand can't say to the foot, I don't need you. And the head is not better than the heart. All the parts of the body are doing their part. And when there's illness, let's say there's blockage to the heart, then the heart has to work harder because another part is not doing what it's supposed to. Lastly, regarding the body, we must be connected to the head, not independent of the head. The body must never forget that without the head, we are dead, we are lifeless, we're a monster. If you saw a body walking around with no head, that would be something for the horror books, wouldn't it? And yet, when we look at church history, we see the reality that people have done many things for Christ, in the name of Christ, but not necessarily connected to Christ, not necessarily in Christ. What do I mean here? Well, think about heretics being burned alive. Even the Reformation, Baptists being drowned by reformers. And if you were to ask them why, if you were to come to those brethren who I believe were Christians and ask them, why are you doing this? Why would you put your fellow brother and sister to death? They would say, well, they're not our brother and sister because they're wrong about this doctrine. And what we do, we do for Christ. What we do, we do in the name of Christ. I'm not down near salvation, but the question must be asked, would Jesus burn Heretics. Would Jesus drown Baptists? History tells us that hundreds, maybe even thousands of women were burned at the stake because they were called witches. Maybe they were, maybe they weren't. But the question remains, would Jesus burn witches at the stake? I mean, the answer is like rhetorical. It's obvious. When you look at the life of Jesus, he's not down to burn people. When they once said, let's bring down 
thunder and fire upon them, the sons of thunder. No, no, no. That's, that's not how Jesus operates. What would Jesus do if some woman was a witch? He would preach the gospel to her. He would invite her and the other untouchables in the community to his home to hear the truth. And if they rejected him, if they rejected the truth, then he would probably do just as he did to the rich young ruler. He would look with love and then let them go. We must be a body connected to our head, meaning in Christ. And we think about the head. Think of all that is found in the head. The eyes are in the head. We must see through the eyes of Christ. The ears are in the head. We must hear the mouth. We must speak. We must think. So much is in the head. It's all for him, through him, and in him. We must be connected to the head, not independent of the head. Well, the verse continues there. He is the beginning. Do you see that? He is the beginning. We know that he is the source. We looked at this last week. He is the source. He's the apex of all creation. He is the reason for all creation. He's the creator of all creation. So what is this saying? He is the beginning. This is saying not only is he the source of all creation, but he is also the source of the new creation. It's beautiful. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning. Re remember the beginning of creation. Genesis 1, 2. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. No shape, no substance, right? No light, is there any hope here? Do we see anything of Darwinistic evolution, um, this, this uh, natural selection? No, there's nothing of that here. When we look at this scene, the earth without form, void, darkness, there is nothing in the earth itself that can help. But what happens? And God said, now that's amazing. Here is a formless, dark void of the earth. But then God speaks. God says, let there be light. And there was light. There was nothing. And then there was light. Why? Because God said it. God saw the light was good. And God separated the light from the darkness. God spoke. God moved. God acted. God created. God initiated what do we know? Who was this? What did we see in the previous verses? By him all things were made. This is our Lord Jesus Christ. Now again, that's the natural creation. Formless, void, dark. So what are we being told here in verse 18? He is the beginning of the new creation. Think of Ezekiel 37. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of the valley. It was full of bones. And he led me around among them. And behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley. They're not even buried. And behold, they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O oh Lord God, you know. What a sight. These not just bones, but these are fossils. These are dry bones. There's no meat. There's no gristle. There's no life. Just a scattered, unclean place. Not even buried. Not in a tomb. Just a graveyard of scattered, dry bones. And then the question, is there any hope for these bones? Does Ezekiel have power in himself to bring these bones to life? Absolutely not. Is there any power or hope in the bones themselves to bring about life? Absolutely not. Here we're reminded, we're, giving, we're being brought back to the picture of creation itself. The same situation, formless, void, dark, no hope. But what happens? God speaks. Now we see a valley of dry bones, no hope, hopeless. There's no help within it. But then what happens? God speaks. Verse, 37, uh, verse 4, Ezekiel 37, then he said to me, see it again, God comes, God acts, God initiates, God speaks, and then things change. Then he said to me, prophesy over these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. 
Thus says the Lord God to these bones, behold, I will cause breath to enter you and you shall live and I will lay sinews upon you and will cause flesh to come upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live and you shall know that I am the Lord. This is amazing. God is doing all of this. This is all him. I will, I will, I will. Like the new covenant, I will give you a new heart. I will put my spirit in you. I will, I will, I will again and again. This is the Lord the beginning of creation. He is also the beginning of the new creation. The dark, hopeless valley of dry bones ultimately became an exceeding great army. How? Because the image of the invisible God is the beginning of not only the physical creation, but also the church, the new creation. And isn't this exactly what we see in uh, Ephesians 2? You were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. You see, first we're given the picture that is dark, bleak, hopeless. Then, God, you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature, remember, and children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, that changes everything. But God, being rich in mercy. Why? Because of the great love with which he loved us. Because we're obedient, because we would be obedient, even when we were dead in our trespasses. What did he do? He made us alive. He is the beginning of creation. He is the beginning of hope. He is the beginning of the new creation. Have you ever heard that song by Chris Tomlin? You spread out the skies over empty space, said let there be light. To a dark and formless world, your light was born, creation. You spread out your arms over empty hearts, said let there be light. And to a dark and hopeless world, your son was born. You made the world and saw that it was good. You sent your only son, for you are good. What a wonderful maker. What a wonderful savior. He is the beginning. And then we get these words, the firstborn from the dead. Here we get this firstborn language again. We saw it earlier. He's the firstborn of creation over all creation. Now we see not only is he the firstborn of creation, but he's also the firstborn from the dead. Now what is firstborn mean? Now we already looked at, we don't want to think firstborn meaning order of appearance, This isn't saying Jesus was the first one to be resurrected. No, we know Elijah and Elisha both did resurrections in the Old Testament. We know Jesus himself. He resurrected uh, the widow's son. He resurrected Jairus' daughter. He resurrected Lazarus. And when Jesus uh, ultimately was um, put to death and the temple, the curtain in the temple split, many from the grave rose. Now, this is not saying that Jesus is the first one to come out of the grave. The firstborn from the dead is saying the same thing that the firstborn of all creation was saying, that he is the highest of the high. He is above. Think about it. Everyone else who went to the grave, how were they brought out? They, they needed a, a, an Elijah. They needed an, an Elisha. They, they needed a Jesus. They needed a miracle worker. They needed some act outside of themselves. But Jesus, Jesus went to the grave and raised himself out of it. John 2, 19 is amazing. Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews said, it's taken 46 years to build this temple. Will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body. When someone dies, brothers and sisters, think of this. When someone dies, what happens? Unless some power outside of themselves, unless some miracle from God is done, that's the end of it. That's why we have funerals. Unless the doctors do their thing, you know, clear, uh, unless God grants mercy, death is the end. They walk through the door of death 
boom, the door slams behind them and there is no exit. But who, who go to the kingdom of death, walks through the door, closes it behind them, stays in there for three days, then kicks the door off the hinges and says, I'm leaving Christ alone. Why? Because he is the firstborn from the dead. Once he did that, he began the end of death itself. He pressed start on the remote control for eternal life to begin. Begin. He clicked to go on the mouse for eschatology to move forward. He rose from the dead as head of new creation. He was the first to rise from the dead, never to die again. Lazarus died after he was resurrected. Jairus' daughter eventually died after she was resurrected. But Christ never died again. He was the first to rise with a glorified body. Don't cling to me, having yet gone to my father. His body glorified, signifying we too, we too, all who come after him, trusting in him, believing in him, relying on him. We have the same hope of resurrection. What was the hope of the Christians in the first century as they were being thrown to lions and bears and burned alive and tortured. It was resurrection. What were the hope of the Christians who died under the bloody reign of Queen Mary? It was the resurrection. What was the hope of the Colossian church, this small church being bullied by Rome, being persecuted by the Jews, being uh, threatened by false teachers? It was the resurrection. And what is your hope? Indeed, the resurrection, not in this world, not in the things that we see, but in the one that is to come. And how do we know? How can you know that you will go to death, the one that has a grasp that does not let go of? Because Christ Jesus is the firstborn of the dead. And because he went to the grave, stayed in there three days, kicked the doors of death off the hinges, said, I'm leaving. And everyone who trusts in me, hopes in me, relies in me, they too will be resurrected. They will have that same hope. John 6, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. There is the promise from the firstborn of the dead. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. That or so that in everything he might be preeminent. So that in everything he will be first. He will be supreme. He will be most important. What are all things? It says in everything. That means both creation and the new creation, because that's exactly what we've looked at before. Last week, creation. This week, new creation. That in everything, meaning he is supreme both over the cosmos and over the church. He is the Lord of the earth and he is Lord of the Christian. He is sovereign, reigning, ruler, supreme, preeminent over angels and humans. He is the one who is preeminent and the cause for and the reason behind and the, the, the for him, both for natural reasons, natural purposes. When you think of why does two plus two always equal four? Because God, the Lord Jesus Christ, he made all things and that includes the law of logic. That's why we're able to have reasonable conversations and to deduct from A equals B to C. But he's also the reason for all spiritual things. Everything is working together for the good of them that love God and are called according to his purpose. And what is that? Ultimately, we're being conformed to whose image? To the image of the invisible God. He is the purpose for your trials. He is the reason. And it is not meaningless suffering that you go through. Do you know that? But there is a point, there is a purpose, and that purpose and that point and those reasons ultimately find their fulfillment in him. That's beautiful. That in everything he might be preeminent. Do you know him? Is, is he this real to you? Do you serve him? 
as though he is that great. You know what this means? This means that the baby in the manger is the image of the invisible God. This means that the carpenter's son is the head of the body, the church. This means that the bloody, dying, gasping for breath, swollen beyond recognition, rabbi on the cross. What else is true of him? He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. For in him, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. For in him, all the fullness of God. That's an amazing statement, especially in light of what is said, right? What, what, the, this, this temple, 1 Kings 8, will God really dwell on earth? The heavens, even the highest heavens, cannot contain thee, cannot contain you, much less this temple that I have built? The, the, the psalmist is flabbergasted in Psalm 139. Where shall I go from your spirit or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. The earth is his footstool. The heaven is his throne. He's too big. He's too great. He's too grand to contain. God doesn't live in temples made by man. This is the eternal God. And surely, surely by looking at he the fullness of God was pleased to dwell in him. We can worship the Lord Jesus Christ for this fact forever. But the main point of Paul is not to lay out for us that the omnipresence of God is contained in the, per in the person of Jesus Christ. We must remember our context. What is this saying? Well, think, think of the Vikings. Thor, you've heard of Thor. Thor is the god of what? All the children said, thunder, right. He's the god of thunder, so-called. The Greeks, they had Ares. He is the god of war. You had Apollo, who was the god of light. You had Venus, who was the goddess of love. Even the Egyptians, they had Osiris, the god of the dead. You had uh, Ra, the god of the sun. You had Isis, the goddess of fertility. The same is true today. You can ask the Lewises about those who practice voodoo in Haiti and how they have all of these different spirits, good and bad, and they have to appease them because here's the spirit of this and the spirit of that and the spirit of this ancestor and that one. You go to the Catholic church. What do you see? You see saints. You see angels. They have this great pantheon. In Hinduism, they have over 330 million gods. You go to Africa, wherever you go on the continent, you see the same reality. There's the God of this and the God of that and the God of this. And in Colossae, the same thing was happening. They had these, this, this notion, remember the Gnostics, they had these eons and all together, collectively, they made up the fullness. There was that Power Ranger robot formed together, but by themselves, not so powerful. And Greek theology, or Greek yeah, mythology rather, not so powerful. Ares could be de defeated. Apollo could be defeated. We talk about Atlas. He lost. And what were they saying about Jesus? Jesus is just one of these emanations. He was just one of this many eons. What does Paul say? Brethren, I pray that this hits you with all the force that the Spirit of God intended for it to come out with. For in him, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Hallelujah. He uses their own language against them. They love talking about fullness. Oh, yes, the eons all together, all these emanations, all of these angels, all these spirits collectively make up the fullness. Paul says, oh, oh, you, you want to hear about fullness? You want to talk about fullness? Well, let me tell you something about fullness. Jesus contains all. All the fullness of the true God in himself alone. You hear Muslims, those who would commit acts of terrorism. And what do they always say before they do it? Allahu Akbar. 
This would be like going to the Muslim terrorists and saying, Yeshua Hu Akbar. It's using the language that they use against them. And this is just like Paul did in Acts 17, which was actually brought up earlier today. You have all these idols. Well, let me talk to you about the idol you have to the unknown God. Even your own poets have said, the fullness of God pleased to dwell in him and through him. So in him and through him. You get this language a lot in this passage. In him, through him, for him, in him, through him. So we know that all the fullness of God, please dwell in him. And now Paul's going to talk about what happens through him and through him to reconcile to himself all things. There it is again. There's everything, all things, all power, fullness. This is speaking of the sufficiency of Christ. He is enough. He's all you need. He's all you need. In him, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. In him, there's fullness. And through him, God is doing the ultimate of all purposes. Have you ever seen a firework show? Maybe 4th of July or a New Year. I mean, like a really good one. You go outside and it's dark and it starts and boom and blast and the lights and the colors and the swizzles and the smokes and the sounds. And it's amazing. I mean, the light the, is dazzling that night sky. But then what happens? After all the fireworks are done, silence, street full of trash. It was nice while it lasted. You go inside, go to bed. Let me tell you this. The gospel is not a firework show. In other words, the coming of Christ, the life of Christ, the death of Christ, the resurrection of Christ, the ascension of Christ, and the return of Christ is not just a god given display of fancy lights and sound and power. There are eternal reasons, purposes, points, plans for what God is doing through Christ. This isn't just to make us say, ooh, and ah, and wow, and wow, that's amazing, and then we just go on about our business. No, the Lord Jesus is bringing sinful man and his Holy Father together in peace to reconcile in himself all things through the blood of his cross in heaven and on earth. He is righting every wrong. He is balancing every scale. He is fixing every problem. What is he bringing? He's bringing us into intimate fellowship, giving us the ability to have triumphant worship, displaying the beauty and joy and glory found in the eternal attributes of God himself. What is the reason? What is the ultimate reason that you have been forgiven of your sin, Christian? Is it just so you can feel better? So you don't feel guilty anymore? No. When there are conflicts in your home, when there's conflicts in your marriage, when there's conflict with relationship, what do you want to be forgiven for? So that you and that other person that you are at odds with can come together again in unity. And intimacy. That's the point. God is reconciling through Jesus all things to himself. What is the point of you being made alive from the grave? So that you can be alive with him forever. What is the ultimate goal of the church? It's not just to gather. It's not just to preach. The ultimate goal of missions is not to make disciples. The ultimate goal of missions is to reconcile to himself those who don't worship the God who made them. The goal of the church is to reconcile all things through Christ back to the God who made us. What is God doing? Remember what Paul said. May you be filled with the knowledge of his will. What is that? That ultimate will. The will that God would be glorified and that those who are in rebellion would be reconciled. Now, some people, some people, because this says through the blood of his cross, some people say this is teaching universalism. In fact, the, the ancient heretic origin. He said, even the devil 
is caught up in this promise of all things being reconciled. The devil's going to be forgiven. Everyone's going to be saved. No. We would have to throw out a lot of Bible, like all of it, in order to believe such a thing. This is not some kumbaya and all that rock kind of thing. No, God loved the world in this way. How? That all who believe, see, you must believe, you must repent or else you perish. There is an if-then condition to salvation. Just because Jesus went to the cross and died and said it's finished does not mean that everyone is automatically saved. No, if You do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Unless you repent, you will likewise perish. God loved the world in this way that all who believe in him will not perish but have eternal life. There are conditions to salvation, namely that by faith you believe in the life and the death and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ and not your own works. This is not teaching some universalism. So what does this mean? To reconcile to himself means to set right. As I said, to right every wrong. Right now, there are rebels to God's authority. Right now, the demons are wreaking havoc. False teachers, even at this very moment, are proclaiming heresy. And you know what else is even more sad? People right now, they're angry. They're angry because our rights as Americans have been taken away. So they're protesting. What do you mean we can't go to the gym? What do you mean we can't go to the movies? What do you mean we have to stay in our homes? How dare you seek to reign over us? How dare you? No, we're going to the streets. We're bearing arms. We're protesting. We're not going to take it anymore. They're so angry. The medical field is doing this. and And the government is doing that. And Bill Gates is doing this. And 5G is doing that. And people are so angry. They're move to action. But let me ask you this, brothers and sisters, how many of them are even a little bit angry over the fact that God is dishonored? How many are taking to the streets within their own hearts because Christ is not valued and honored and worshipped and they'd rather have basketball back than the God who made them being worshipped? That's the true sadness of it all. That is the condition right now. All things are not reconciled to himself because there are still rebels. There are still people who seek their own authority. There are still people who love sports and movies and toys and books and possessions and themselves and money and freedom and autonomy more than Jesus Christ, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the body, the church, the firstborn of the dead, the beginning. That is the true tragedy of tragedies. But the day is coming when every rebel will be judged, when every enemy will be subdued, when demons will be banished. Douglas Moo writes this, God's intention of ultimately bringing all of creation under his rule through Christ. Christ rules the church with the purpose, here's the plan, of bringing all things ultimately within the scope of that rule. In other words, as 1 Corinthians 15 says, then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and enemies are under his feet. John MacArthur says their relationship to him, meaning those that are in rebellion, that remain in rebellion, that don't come in by faith to Christ while time is now. Today is the day. Harden not your heart. If you don't know him, today is the day. You, you believe today because the day is coming when he will make all things right. Their relationship to him will change from that of enemies to that of the judged. They will be sentenced to hell, unable any longer to pollute God's creation. They will be stripped of their power and forced to bow in submission to God. John MacArthur. Or as Hebrews 2 says, listen to this. It has been testified somewhere. Got to love that, right? You don't always have to know the, the, the place in the Bible where something's written. It has been testified somewhere. What is man that you are mindful of him? Or the son of man that you care for him? You made him a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his 
feet. Now, in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. Now, this is it. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him. Does that bother you? That everything is not in subjection to him. But we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. He's reconciling all things to himself. He's going to make peace. Every knee will bow. Either your knees will be bashed with an iron rod, or your knees will gladly bow because of the love in your heart, but every knee will be bowed before him. Every tongue will confess, either because they're being thrown into hell and they know they have no power, no authority, they're not in control of their lives. The Lord, the Lamb who reigns on the throne, the one whose face I'm trying to hide myself from, he is Lord, and I have no option but to declare that lordship as they're being thrown into the lake of fire, or in joy, worshiping around the throne, we say, he is Lord. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. Well, how is there peace for those who are brought in? He's made peace through the death of the Son by the blood of the cross. Jesus died to make peace. Jesus died. And this is where I'm, I'm, I'm closing here. For to us a child is born, Isaiah 9, 6, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of what? Of peace. Jesus is the only one who makes peace between holy God and sinful man. How can man have peace with God? Because the Prince of Peace, by his blood, poured out upon the cross, took the suffering and punishment that we rightly deserve. He is the Prince of Peace. He made peace because of His blood. In, in Him, all things are found. He is sufficient for salvation. Are you sure you have peace with God this morning? Are you not sure. Don't you want to know? Don't you want to know if you have peace with the God who made you? Or are you aware, I don't have peace with him. I don't have peace within myself. I surely don't have peace with God. Well, there is one way of having peace. And you don't have to go to priests. You don't have to go to monks. You don't have to make a pilgrimage. You don't have to pray to angels or saints. You don't have to appease all these so-called gods and goddesses. You don't have to do all these rituals and routines. You go to one source. You go to one place. You go to the beginning. You go to the head of the body, the church. You go to the image of the invisible God. It is him and him alone where everything you need for salvation is found. Well, let me just close with this last story. I, I was literally talking to a friend of mine last week and, and he asked this question. He said, if a good friend of yours was about to die and they only had five minutes, what would you say to them? What hope could you give them? Where would you point them so that they would know without a shadow of a doubt that they will go and be with God in peace forever? And that was such an easy question. And you all know it. And it's exactly what Colossians 1, 18 through 20 is saying. Christ. Why? Because in him. All the fullness of God is pleased to dwell. In him you get forgiveness. In him you get mercy. In him you get salvation. In him you get love. In him you get light. In him you get knowledge. In him you get wisdom. In him you get truth. In him you get understanding. In him you get all the promises of God. In him you get fellowship. In him you get unity. In him you get the spirit. In him you get reconciled. In him you get everything because Christ is all. He is sufficient. All you need is Christ. Father, thank you for your son. Thank you for his blood. Thank you for the truth that Jesus Christ is the sufficient Savior. And if we go to him, we need to go nowhere else because in him, all the fullness of God is pleased to dwell. 
May this strike us, impact us, and move us as it's meant to. In Jesus' name, amen.